so it's uh, it's my privilege today to uh, to introduce um, somebody you've heard from already today, and you'll hear more from uh, before the uh, sessions are over at the Ed Forum, uh, Dr. Judith Trotman, uh, and she was earlier introduced with her uh, title at uh, head of hematology at Concord Repatriation Hospital at the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, she has an extensive bio with wonderful details about all the things she does, but what I really noticed in reading it is that in almost all cases, she is showing leadership. Uh, leadership in research, leadership in formulating clinical trials and supporting their uh, uh, patients and participation. And uh, so obviously she's made a real difference uh, in the, the, the business of treating uh, WM and she's been focused on WM, although she does more work than that, for sure. Uh, but what I think is probably the, a distinguishing thing for, for Dr. Trotman is she clearly gets the award for the speaker having traveled the greatest distance coming from Australia to be with us. So with that, I'll just turn it over to Dr. Trotman. Thank you very, very much. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I have to say, I don't think I'm going to come back to Seattle again, though, because I've, I'm told I've seen it in its finest, and I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to keep that, those marvellous memories of, of, a, of a beautiful city. Um, so it's interesting that I was given this uh, topic, pick, pick your poison. Oops, sorry, IT guys, I wasn't supposed to pull that up. Um, pick your poison, and I want to remind you all that pick your poison is a term used for making a choice between two undesirable options. Um, and so I thought, well, that's, that's fair enough, but we should also be a little bit more optimistic. And so I've added my own title, Playing the Long Game, because I do think that you do need to be thinking about the the decision making in terms of longevity and uh, sequencing of, of therapies. I'd like to uh, note there I have uh, trials funding to my institution, um, in particular um, from PCYC or Janssen um, to, as an investigator in the Innovate study, and then from Beijing as an investigator in their studies in uh, Waldenstrom's but no uh, personal financial conflicts. And also thank the slides that Dr. Paludo presented last year were so good, I've taken a number of them as a scaffold uh, for this talk. We're going to review the current treatment options, uh, focus a little bit on emerging therapies and clinical trials, but not too much, because I understand you're going to get uh, a talk on that uh, later, and uh, try not to be too much of a zealot, but uh, encourage you to consider participation in clinical trials. So I guess chemotherapy was last century. Uh, chemotherapy alone. I think the advent of rituximab, the anti-CD20 antibody, uh, in the, you know, in 1998 and subsequently, uh, was a real revolution in in the care of patients for Waldenstrom's in being able to add rituximab uh, to that chemotherapy. But for me personally, as a, as a Waldenstrom's doctor, uh, the moment for me was the end of FCR uh, in 2004, when I no longer had to use this terribly immune suppressive chemotherapy combination uh, in my patients when we uh, were allow allowed to um, start using dexamethasone, rituximab and cyclophosphamide on the basis of the data from Athens, uh, and then subsequently bendamustine and rituximab. So so that combination immuno, meaning antibody, and chemotherapy uh, approach. Uh, and those two regimens are still very much the pillar immunochemotherapy approaches for Waldenstrom's that I will discuss in greater detail. But there's no doubt as well that the advent of the BTK inhibitor ibrutinib was, was a real game changer. Uh, and then the subsequent second generation uh, BTK inhibitors as well. Um, so what treatments do patients get? 
And I think the most wonderful thing about the Whimsical Patient Registry, and I do hope you will all uh, join Whimsical and iteratively at a few settings over a cup of tea, uh, start entering your own, own data into this uh, global registry. Because you are now telling us what the treatment patterns are around the world. So I can say to Dr. Ansel as much as I like, well, I always use BR or whatever, but it's my patients who put their data into the registry that really say what Australian doctors are using in terms of treatment for, for Waldenstrom's. Um, and uh, it's interesting and whimsical, we're echoing the data that we get from registries. The median age at diagnosis is 62, uh, mostly men, mostly white men. Um, the median number of lines of treatment is one, and that IQR is what we call the interquartile range, the middle 50% of patients. So the middle 50% of patients receive one to two lines of therapy. And in our sunburst chart on the bottom corner there from uh, Whimsical, you'd be amazed that you know there are actually a couple of patients there who've had 10 different lines of, of therapy. But for the majority of patients, it's, it's just one, two, or sometimes uh, three. And 18% of the patients who are participating in Whimsical uh, are still undergoing a watch and wait observation approach. But there are numerous first-line treatments, and before 2016, rituximab monotherapy was the most common one used. Um, rituximab in combination with uh, cyclophosphamide was uh, the second most common, and then in combination with bendamustine uh, or uh, dexamethasone, rituximab, and, and cyclophosphamide. Uh, Fludarabine-based treatments were still um, reasonably commonly used before 2016, but after 2016, of 233 first-line treatments, you can see the marked increase in the use of bendamustine and rituximab as first-line treatment, and the advent of the BTK inhibitors as well, with a lower reliance on rituximab monotherapy on its own, and the use of dexamethasone rituximab in combination with cyclophosphamide. And pleasingly for me, and I must admit I'm not someone who's used a lot of bortezomib, the proteasome inhibitor, um, I, I am, however, pleased that it's not included in the first-line therapy uh, because of its uh, particular toxicity with neuropathy. So I think what is very important uh, where possible is not just a second opinion, but you know, you heard us all up the front here, and you effectively got four nuanced opinions. And that's why I think the multidisciplinary team review of your diagnosis, making sure you get the diagnosis right, and it is indeed Waldenstrom's, not marginal zone, or some other uh, lymphoproliferative disorder. Uh, good pathology review, good radiology review um, is, is so important, and in Australia, um, we call that the multidisciplinary uh, team meeting. I understand in the, in the US it's a tumour board. But I would be saying when you're diagnosed, um, you know, is my case going to be presented at a tumour board um, and you know could I potentially get the uh, outcomes from that so in terms of the classification of treatment options I've already and you're all very familiar with the chemo immunotherapy combinations and they tend to be of a very fixed duration so DRC will go for uh, six cycles for about four months and bendamustine rituximab for six cycles over six months um, if you combine rituximab with uh, any of those proteasome inhibitor therapies, uh, it's listed down there. But then you move on to more continuous therapies, which are the targeted therapies, the uh, BTK inhibitors, uh, which end in NIB, either xanabrutinib, acalabrutinib, or ibrutinib and uh, then the later, the B-cell 2 inhibitors. And the way I think of uh, describe these targeted therapies to my patients is that it's like a switch. It's like a light switch. And you will switch off the activity of the Waldenstrom's so long as you keep taking it. But when you stop it, eventually, it might not happen in the first week or two or three, but eventually I expect that it will um, come back again. Uh, and so it's taking your uh, disease controlling agent just as if you were taking your blood pressure uh, tablet and turning this uh, disease into a chronic manageable condition. 
So let's get down and deep into the commonly used treatments. Uh, and the first is my preferred treatment for the young, fit patient in whom I'm aiming for the, the deepest, most durable response uh, in ideally a, a, a most rapid time. And this is an intravenous infusion. The rituximab and the bendamustine are given on day one and the bendamustine alone on day two. So it's two days of bendamustine every month uh, for six cycles. And virtually everyone will respond to bendamustine rituximab. Um, most people will get a, a major response um, with at least a 50% reduction in their IgM level, and you will see their hemoglobin and their IgM uh, mirror image, uh, and I've got some examples of that. And it tends to usually uh, last uh, for, for a good six years. Uh, there is significant debate that you heard um, uh, us allude to up the front over the dose and the duration. And I must admit I'm a bit of a purist and I tend to say I start bendamustine and rituximab in someone in whom I expect to give them the full six cycles uh, of, of therapy. Now, I may not be able to deliver that, uh, the full six cycles at full dose, but that's the patient population in whom I opt for bendamustine and rituximab, uh, whereas the other patient who I consider is not fit enough for that, but is still fit enough for immunochemotherapy, I will give them dexamethasone, rituximab, and cyclophosphamide. Um, and that's my rather simple way of, of approaching it uh, because I don't believe we have really robust, and I know we don't have robust prospective data comparing 70 milligram per meter squared versus 90 milligram per meter squared of rituximab, um, four cycles versus six cycles. Um, and I think it would be uh, perhaps incorrect to make assumptions that just because someone has had uh, a lower dose, they are still going to get the same bang for their buck, but not as profound immune suppression. You know, it's that whole, you know, grandma tells you can't have your cake and eat it too. You know, you can't expect that you're going to have as good a response uh, to your Waldenstroms uh, at the same time as reducing the toxicity of, of therapy. Um, there are uh, common uh, side effects that occur with bendamustine. You've heard about the low blood count, the neutropenia, which to me almost seems inevitable after about four cycles. Patients will get a little bit neutropenic, and we give them the colony stimulating factor, the, the hormone-like injection that they... Uh, we all produce to encourage our neutrophils to recover after chemotherapy. We just give that in bigger doses, little injections under the skin um, to support the neutrophil counts uh, as we go through, through the treatments. Um, and many of you, uh, in fact, one day, uh, can I make a vote for next, uh, in two years' time? I think you should have a talk about rituximab infusional reactions. And I think you guys should give the talk, all right? Because I'm sure there are many experts in, in the room, and I reckon that's something that um, the IWMF should be getting some good uh, data about. In fact, we'll probably get some... We'll look deep into the um, whimsical data and see how many of you have had uh, rituximab reactions uh, because that is such a common thing that occurs in patients with Waldenstrom's, not necessarily just in the first dose, but can occur any time. You may have had rituximab, you know, three different times over, over 20 years and then suddenly, lo and behold, you have an infusional reaction on your fourth dose the fourth time you have it. Um, and there are, there are some tricks that we all have uh, to help manage that. And I'm going to move on because I'm going talking too, too slowly, sorry. So this is an example of a classic patient in whom I will give rituximab and bendamustine. This 60-year-old uh, manager is working full time. He's very fatigued. Uh, he has joint aches. Uh, his haemoglobin is 10 grams per deciliter. I've kept my numbers uh, here that we use in Australia because I've got the graphs from Australia. So you can see his haemoglobin down there. Does this pointer actually work? Can you see? We've got two. All right, which one are you going to go to? We'll go to the right. Okay. So his haemoglobin's uh, 10 grams per deciliter, and his IgM is uh, 36,000. And you can see with his six cycles of bendamustine rituximab how nicely his haemoglobin has come up and how quickly his IgM has come down. 
Um, he did need GCSF for his low neutrophil count um, on cycle, and that's actually cycle five. I tell a lie. I sent these slides um, to my patients just to check with them that they had their consent to present their, their data, even though it's de-identified, and he did correct me. It was actually cycle, six, uh, cycle five when he needed his GCSF, but it was very well tolerated with no infections, and his hemoglobin came up, as you can see, to the normal range, uh, and his IgM is two grams per litre, and and in retrospect, he says, yeah, you're right, I was more tired uh, than I thought I was before treatment. Moving on to DRC is the, is the more gentler chemotherapy and the one that I, I like to use when I'm aiming for, for low toxicity in the, in the less fit patients. It's given intravenously every uh, three weeks and then there are the uh, oral cyclophosphamide tablets as well that patients take um, for five days. And it has a slightly lower uh, overall response rate and a slightly lower duration of response. Now, the way we measure duration of response in our drug registration trials is called progression-free survival. And that is defined by progression of the disease. So, for example, in Waldenstrom's, if the IgM, one marker of progression, the most common marker of progression, is if your IgM goes up by five grams per litre. Progression of disease or death. Now that might not be from Waldenstrom's, it might be death from another cause. And that progression-free survival is a very important factor to remember that that includes death, given that dying of other causes is something that patients with Waldenstrom's um, will, will often have. Um, there are the same similar side effects that you have with bendamustine and rituximab, just, uh, sorry, with bendamustine, just not the same uh, profound cytopenias, the same profoundly low blood counts um, and increased uh, risk of infections. So when I decide, am I going to give bendamustine rituximab first line or am I going to give uh, dexamethasone rituximab, I have to consider the patient's life expectancy as well as their, their desires, how much they want to uh, push through with their chemotherapy. And this is a woman who, uh, when she came to me, she was 78, but her Waldenstrom's had been diagnosed in 2016 when her IgM was 8 grams per litre. Uh, and it's really helpful, really, really helpful. I always try and get my patients to dig out any old bloods because they'll always have a total protein even if they haven't got an IgM. And that helps me work out the tempo of their disease, which is so important when choosing your treatment. And when she was referred in 2000, uh, her haemoglobin was nicely in the normal range and her IgM was... I can't see it there, what was it, about 22, uh, tw sorry, 27, so 2,700 uh, grams per deciliter, uh, milligrams per deciliter, and she was very fit, although she did have what we call moderate aortic stenosis, so narrowing of her um, heart valve um, in, in called the aorta. Uh, and uh, in early 2022, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, she started noting she was getting fatigued when walking up hills, and you can see there, watching the tempo of her disease, the haemoglobin is trending down. Um, it's not that magic 100 grams per litre where we often say is a, is a marker for starting treatment, but her IgM is going up to 45 grams, per, uh, 45 grams per litre, if you'll let me continue to describe the, the, the figures that I know. Um, and, and it's the combination of that anemia and the raised IgM that is starting to contribute to her exercise intolerance. And so we decided we would give her dexamethasone, rituximab and cyclophosphamide as a fixed duration therapy in the midst of the Omicron uh, wave. And you can see how nicely her um, IgM started coming down and how her haemoglobin, and I can tell you now, it's, it's uh, now right up in, in the normal range. Um, so a much less commonly used treatment, as I've shown you now, is rituximab monotherapy, but a number of you would have had rituximab on its own. To me, I prefer 
the synergy of rituximab with chemotherapy, even if it's only a small dose of cyclophosphamide and some oral dexamethasone, um, because I do believe you do get better responses and longer responses. But we do sometimes now consider using rituximab for the immune-driven hemolytic anemia, red cell destruction of cells um, by antibodies, uh, which causes anemia. And some people, you know, I do sometimes use it for patients uh, with an IgM-based neuropathy to see if we can try and stabilize the progression of their neuropathy. I've never seen it go away with rituximab monotherapy but sometimes, you know, maybe in about a third or a quarter of patients, you can have stabilisation of, of progression. And then came along ibrutinib. And I have to say, as a, a haematologist, it was a real privilege, absolute privilege, to be participating in the Innovate trial, where patients were randomised to either ibrutinib and rituximab compared to rituximab monotherapy, which was then considered a reasonable standard of care for the treatment of Waldenstrom's. Now, the obvious uh, lack in this trial was the fact that there wasn't a third arm of ibrutinib on its own. And I do suspect that um, there is not quite the same added value when you add rituximab to a BTK inhibitor as when you add it to, uh, to chemotherapy. But abrutinib was a first-in-class uh, enzyme inhibitor, and what it does is it, it inhibits the uh, brutin tyrosine kinase enzyme inside the cell that is driving the proliferation of the Waldenstrom cells and their prolonged survival. And uh, it literally is a switch. It's well tolerated, but there are common side effects that many of you will know very well. And there is significant bruising, uh, mostly on the uh, arms and hands, uh, but very uh, much less commonly, there is a, a rate of severe, uh, uh, serious, infection, uh, serious bleeding. Um, low blood counts are common, um, joint pains, and as, as you've all heard, the atrial fibrillation is, is more common uh, with a brutinib uh, than with the second generation BTK inhibitors. And hypertension, uh, after you've been taking uh, a brutinib for some years, you'll start seeing a significant uh, rate of, of hypertension. But we also have to accept that we are all old, getting older and uh, atrial fibrillation and hypertension. You know, atrial fibrillation occurs in 70% of otherwise, um, you, know, you know, people in their 80s who don't have, have Waldenstrom's. So we, we need to just always remember there's a back, background rate of atrial fibrillation and hypertension. And it has a, a very good response rate and the duration of response we're really not sure exactly what the median duration of response is with the brutinib. It may well be more than that 39 months that I've listed there. Um, and because you need to start slicing and dicing it in terms of people by their mutation status. Um, so the, the best risk population, the patients who are mid-88 mutated and are CXCR4 wild type, so the 70% of patients with Waldenstrom's who are CXCR4 wild type, will have a five-year progression-free survival of 70%. Ibrutinib is the first in class, but there has been a phase three, a randomized clinical trial comparing ibrutinib with xanabrutinib that makes it clear to me it's not the best in class. However, for patients who are on ibrutinib and who are tolerating it well, there is no way you would want to switch your BTK inhibitor. It's working well for you, so stick with it. And there is definitely evidence now that we have seen that dose reductions for intolerance, which are actually done more commonly in women, suggesting there's a, a gender issue there in terms of what the right dose should have been, um, but particularly those who are elderly, that dose reduction does not impair disease control. In fact, outcomes were, were a little bit better in the patients who um, had had dose reductions uh, for intolerance. So I, I strongly recommend that if it's working for you, stick with it. Xanabrutinib is my preferred BTK inhibitor. It's efficacious and tolerable. 
we have better, very good partial response rates, um, and that is defined by more than 90% reduction in the IgM level. So that's uh, at the four-year follow-up of the Aspen study, uh, that VGPR rate is 38% compared to 25%. Now that, however, is not the most important advantage of Xanabrutinib. And to be honest, um, I initially refused to participate in the Aspen study because I still had patients getting xanabrutinib in the phase two study, and I'd had my experience with the brutinib in Innovate, I'd had my experience with uh, xanabrutinib in the 003 study, and I knew which BDK inhibitor was the better tolerated BDK inhibitor. So I felt, no, no thanks, but no thanks. I don't want to randomize my patient. Let someone else down the road uh, and participate in the trial and get access to, to Xanabrutinib or Brutinib for, for their patients. Um, so I, I sort of pretty much uh, made up my, my mind. Um, Xanabrutinib can be given um, twice a day or once a day. It, it probably doesn't matter whether you take two in the morning, two in the evening, or, or four, in the, four once a day. Um, and like a Brutinib, it is a switch. Uh, you will have a, a very good response uh, to Xanabrutinib. But to me, the most important advantage of Xanabrutinib is the quality of life improvements in comparison to a Brutinib, with lower rates of bruising, lower rates of nausea, lower rates of diarrhea. You know, having a bowel motion two or three times a day is very socially disabling for a lot of people in terms of being out and about uh, in t around town. Um, lower rates of hypertension and fewer cardiac effects. We all con you know, focus on the atrial fibrillation, but there is very rare ventricular tachycardias that um, you know, are quite significant um, uh, and obviously life-threatening in patients uh, on ibrutinib. And as evidence of the better tolerance, the discontinuation rate is only 9 compared to 21%. The other thing I like about Xanabrutinib is that the patients who are mid-88 wild type and the patients who are CXCR4 mutated um, seem to have, uh, when you're doing cross-trial comparisons, seem to have a better response to uh, Xanabrutinib. And the four-year progression-free survival is 78%. So here is my frail 84-year-old man with chronic sinusitis and, and heart issues, and his, his Waldenstrom's was diagnosed in 2009. He was watched and waited until 2020 and had one cycle of rituximab and bendamustine at the age of 80 uh, and swore he would never have it again. So he only had one, one two doses of, of bendamustine. Having said that, didn't it work well for him? It worked very, very nicely, just that, that one cycle uh, for quite a while. He was referred to me in 2021 and with symptomatic progression, and you can see his haemoglobin gradually dropping and his IgM gradually coming up over the, the next 18 months, two years. Um, and the symptoms of fatigue and breathlessness, we started him on Xanabrutinib. And you can see, you know, I've, I've, I've witnessed this with the Xanabrutinib, you know, they get there with the Brutinib, they get there just a little bit faster with Xanabrutinib. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter. That's not, for me, the defining difference between the two drugs. It's the tolerance. Um, and he had a rapid improvement in his excise tolerance and just has a short pauses um, for four days for skin cancer removal, which unfortunately is the, um, you know, happens in just about every single Waldenstrom's patient I have in Australia um, who uh, does, um, you know, has a significant sun exposure in the era before um, sunblock. Um, and when he looked at this uh, slide, he said, you've got to tell him I'm back at bowls. So there you go. He's, he's very happy uh, that he's uh, back bowling. He's got the energy for that. So my preferred first-line treatment for most patients is rituximab chemotherapy. Bendamustine rituximab for the younger fitter and DRC for the older with a life expectancy of greater than seven years. But if their life expectancy is less than seven years because of other comorbidities, I do choose xanabrutinib um, because for me it's the closest to what I describe as a set and forget medicine which is uh, so well tolerated although I do have to monitor them initially in the first uh, few months a bit more closely for, uh, for low neutrophils. 
and conscious of the time, I'm going to whip past, but you can see here, it's very interesting, and this is why I want you know, hundreds more of you to join into the whimsical uh, study so we can see which is going to be the winner between bendamustine rituximab and BTK inhibitors in terms of the time to next treatment, which to me, I think, is a more important endpoint uh, than progression-free survival uh, for patients. So uh, progression-free survival, I've said, is based on that five gram per litre rise in the IgM level. And the Dutch have uh, done their discrete choice experiment study and noted that that is the first, uh, the number one patient priority. But I wonder if patients uh, really knew what progression-free survival meant, that I would argue that time to next treatment and quality of life are as or uh, more relevant uh, for patients. And it would be wonderful if we could uh, dev devise a WM-specific health utility index akin to the quality adjusted life year that incorporates the impact of both quantity and quality of life for economic evaluation. I argue that we shouldn't leave, abdicate our responsibility to our funders to work out qualities. Um, we, with the patient community, should be working out some sort of utility index. But of course, how on earth would we derive such a utility measure on which a group of clinicians, statisticians, and patients uh, would substantially agree? So I'm just now going to whip through another case study that to me illustrates the importance of the long game. This gentleman uh, presented to me in 2004 at the age of 49. He had some mild leg cramps and the occasional night sweat. Uh, what is interesting, we know 7% at least of patients will have a family history of other B-cell malignancies like this man. Uh, and his bone marrow biopsy shown there had 40% infiltration with uh, Waldenstrom's. And I educated him about watch and wait, and we would sort of said that probably would treat you when your hemoglobin started approaching um, 10 grams per deciliter, or your IgM was 5,000 milligrams per deciliter, so that we could accommodate any IgM flare that occurred with rituximab, but that we would do that decision about treatment uh, based around your, your uh, social and employment priorities. He did have treatment uh, in a, after two years of watch and wait, you can see there. And I just read the abstract by uh, Miletios Demopoulos um, at a conference suggesting this novel treatment of uh, dexamethasone, rituximab, and cyclophosphamide, which didn't have the stem cell toxicity of the uh, oral chlorambucil. Uh, he uh, tolerated it very well. Um, you'll note he had a little IgM flare, because this is when we started him and his IgM went up uh, with the treatment, but he had a very good partial response, which lasted for 10 years, and then he had uh, progressive uh, disease over the next two years. And in 2018, we gave him DRC again. Uh, it was less well tolerated with uh, recurrent sinusitis, but he got another four years of uh, very good partial response. Uh, in, during COVID, he retired to the south coast of New South Wales, and one wonderful legacy of COVID was telehealth appointments. Uh, so he continues to see me via telehealth, and while it's not my laboratory that measures his results, he's entered his results into Whimsical. And in 2023, with recurrent sweats and fatigue and his IgM uh, going up, not as high as it did originally, not as high as it did second time, but in addition, he had a very low albumin, which to me is an important marker of health and nutrition and, and fitness, and itself uh, a, another reason why I wanted to start treating this man. And he commenced sanibrutinib, his IgM came down, and he became asymptomatic within a week. Uh, he does have some mild hand bruising. There is still bruising in patients, a number of patients with xanabrutinib, just not to the same, uh, same degree. So this 68-year-old has been treated twice with DCR, is now on xanabrutinib with an excellent quality of life. Of course, he, like everyone else on xanabrutinib, um, you know, the pioneers, they start a drug and you don't know how long it's going to last for. And they keep saying, well, how long is it going to last for? And I say, well, you're, you're one of the first ones. I can't, you know, you're going to tell me. Um, but uh, I keep reminding patients that, you know, patients with WM die from secondary cancers. You know, we see a lot more prostate cancer. Um, I've seen uh, people with colon cancer, breast cancer are with WM. Um, and, and 
and other vascular causes as often from, as from their WM. Um, and he wants to live to 85. And I'm thinking, well, OK, we'll try. Um, Pertubrutinibus on rotoclax, BDK degraders, maybe they'll help us there. So let's talk briefly about these potential new therapies um, and the fact that there are also uh, novel combinations of established treatments uh, being trialled. Um, but there are, uh, I'll flick on to the next slide, um, there are other covalent BTK inhibitors, terabrutinib or alabrutinib um, being developed in Asia. Acalabrutinib is another extremely well tolerated uh, oral BTK inhibitor um, that is available in some jurisdictions. Um, I've used it for other diseases. I'm not allowed to use it for WM in um, Australia. And I do get a bit frustrated with the, the mild headache, but then patients can take it with a cup of coffee, and that seems to settle it down. Um, the non-covalent BTK inhibitors um, have about uh, two-thirds of patients will respond to pertubrutinib, even if they have had a uh, previous exposure to a covalent BTK inhibitor. And so this is a really promising agent. Unfortunately, I don't know how much you can get access to pertubrutinib uh, in the US. Thank you for your feedback. Um, because, and even in the compassionate access schedule, I think we all leapt on these compassionate access programs and created a huge drug supply issue globally. So unfortunately, that, that has shut down. But hopefully, uh, that will um, uh, become available in the future with a similar uh, side effect profile to the other BTK inhibitors. Why have we frozen? Ah, oh, there we go. OK. So um, there are these other enzyme inhibitors uh, called BCL2 enzyme inhibitors that are used in other uh, B cell lymphoproliferative disorders. And venetoclax is not yet approved in any country. Um, here is the uh, publication from Jorge Castillo's um, presentation. And you can see that um, you know patients will have a sort of looks like a good sort of two-year progression-free survival, and then things tend to drop off. I mean, there's not too many patients in this study, so we've got pretty wide confidence intervals there. But most people will uh, respond to oral venetoclax. My personal uh, experience with venetoclax is that I don't have a sense that it has as deep a response in terms of the uh, reduction in IgM level and improvement in hemoglobin, as you see with the BTK inhibitor. But I think it synergizes very, very very well with rituximab. And so I have had a few patients who said, I'm not having rituximab again. And I've said, yes, you are. We're going to work this one out. <laughs> right. I said, if you're going to have this venetoclax and you've only had a minor response, well, then you promise me, won't you, that we'll sneak a little bit of rituximab into you and I'll dose you up with lots of steroids. And sure enough, they've been, both of them have been very, very happy to have had the synergy of rituximab with their venetoclax um, and uh, have tolerated uh, rituximab uh, very well. And in that situation, it's the one situation where I actually use a maintenance rituximab program in patients who have had uh, venetoclax. And we've well, now got access to the second generation BCL2 inhibitor, somrotoclax, in clinical trials. I don't know it's going to be such a game changer in the same way that xanabrutinib was with the brutinib, because as I said, xanabrutinib Xanabrutinib was a game changer primarily because of the improved um, tolerance profile. Venetoclax is a very well tolerated uh, drug, so it'll be interesting to see. Um, the one extra thing I do want to talk about is the very promising uh, mechanism of action of the protein degraders, as opposed to inhibiting the BTK enzyme, actually degrading the enzyme. And we've got uh, four patients in this trial who are, who are doing very well. Uh, the bispecific T cell engagers are being studied, um, alternative antibodies and cellular therapies that I'm sure you'll all, all hear about. Um, and then the 
Iopofacine, I can never pronounce it, um, is a very uh, effective, has uh, just had um, uh, an announcement about a, a very high major response rate in, in patients, um, but because it uh, is a radio conjugate that uh, targets lipid rafts in the uh, Waldenstrom cells, there is some innocent bystander effect on the other uh, blood forming cells in the bone marrow, so patients generally do need platelet transfusion and red cell transfusion support um, uh, in the weeks after they've uh, received this radioimmunoconjugate. And I just want to remind you that there are some things that we shouldn't be trialling again in Waldenstrom's. Um, when we had two patients with tizolizumab, a PD-1 antibody, who had profound autoimmune hemolysis that was, you know, was really quite scary for us, um, we stopped the studies of tizoluzumab. Uh, fortunately, both patients uh, recovered uh, on the xanabrutinib alone. Um, we've shown that venetoclax and abrutinib might work very well at bringing your IgM down, but there are way too many cardiac toxicities to be combining uh, these two agents. Um, so it reminds us again of the importance of robust um, clinical trials where safety is always the number one priority. And with that, I'm going to just point out that there's um, many, many years. Uh, we can appreciate your frustration, but there is a very long time in, in drug development uh, over, over years. And even after uh, drugs have been released, um, as we all remember from the thalidomide story, um, post-market surveillance is, is very important. A good clinical trial will ask the right question, it's ethically justifiable and conducted ethically according to the very strict code of good clinical practice. And this allows our laboratory breakthroughs to be translated into the clinic. And why would you participate? Because of the direct benefit to you from the studied therapy and even when the treatment is standard, even if you were randomised in a phase three trial to the standard of care arm, you'd probably have better outcomes because of that meticulous concierge care by your clinical trials nurse. It of course benefits medicine and science and future patients and is, a, is, a, is an access uh, to new therapies. But it's also important you ask the question of why you wouldn't participate in a trial. It might not be the right question for you. Um, the direct risks are usually relatively easily quantified, but it's often easier just to have standard of care. Um, and however, most WM patients have plenty of time to really consider the details and the, the potential risks and benefits of, of clinical trials participation. Always consider a trial if it fits well with your treatment goals and that of, of your community. Um, how we find trials in Australia, we have this neat ClinTrial Refer app that we can identify um, and identify all the currently recruiting trials because a patient is not interested in the trial that's closed uh, its recruitment. And with that, I want to remind you that when you pick your poison, please do think about your sequencing of therapy um, because I do hope that we are playing the long game in the management of your Waldenstroms. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take questions. In fact, I'll be very disappointed if there isn't a single question. <laughs> we can't lose this opportunity, people. Yeah. This is Dr. Judith yeah. Trotman. Come on behind me. I'm going to start yeah. us off. Yeah, sure. Um, we're we're going to have the joy of hearing from you at um, the Ask the Doctor panel tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, which Pete and I will be moderating. So I would love to ask you to reiterate a little bit more tomorrow about clinical trials, sure. the what, you know, and, and we mm -hmm. can go through and because I know you got rushed at the end there a bit. So I just wanted okay. to guarantee that that would happen as well. Mm -hmm. So um, anybody, here we go. Here's the first brave soul. Uh, what about the sequencing of treatments? Well, that's why I like to start with immunochemotherapy anybody I can. Because if we start with a BTK inhibitor, and let's say you get 10 years out of your BTK inhibitor, so you, you've done very well, and many people, you know, I've got patients who have been on xanabrutinib and abrutinib for, you know, seven, eight, nine, nine years. You're going to be 10 years older. And if your doctor didn't think you were fit enough and well enough for 
immunochemotherapy when you were 70, it's going to be a bit harder to get it into you when you're, um, when you're 80. So, you know, we know these, these wonderful oral enzyme inhibitors, these switch agents, are wonderful agents, but it's good to have them in your back pocket if you're fit enough for chemotherapy. Jeff, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, you had mentioned sinusitis mm -hmm. in a couple of your patients. Mm -hmm. I suffer terribly from that. Yeah. Could, can you address that at all? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's the sinusitis because of the, every, you know, plenty of people get sinusitis. There's the sinusitis because of the immune suppression from the Waldenstroms and its treatment, and predominantly its treatment. Where the immune suppression from Waldenstroms kicks in, I think, is primarily in its suppression of the production of the normal immunoglobulin levels. And so if a patient has an IgG level of less than six grams per litre and recurrent infections or one life-threatening infections, um, we are um, allowed to give them immunoglobulin replacement therapy. And the thing about sinusitis is I send them to an ENT specialist so that the ENT specialist really gets them, you know, using their fist saline drops and, you know, Often they need very prolonged courses of antibiotics to really clear out the bacterial infection. Yes, last question. Um, if you're on a treatment and you mm. find out that uh, it's very effective in uh, reducing the IgM, mm. but it has all these side effects, how do you address the low hemoglobin, the low white cells, the uh, low platelets? So uh, m mostly it's not a low hemoglobin. Mostly you'll see, as you've, if you've got control of your Waldstroms, the hemoglobin will come, come up like a mirror image with the IgM level. The management of the low, plate, uh, the low uh, neutrophil count is very easily done with GCSF injections. So I have a couple of patients um, who are on venetoclax, for example, who just give themselves a GCSF injection once a week, just to keep their neutrophils above one. We don't need it normal, we just like to have it above one. And if you have good disease control, you shouldn't have a lot problem with low platelets unless it's an immune problem or if it's because of, you know, you've had multiple lines of treatment and you're needing some chemotherapy agent. Yeah. Sorry, last question. Okay, thank you. Um, I've noticed several examples mm. where um, people hadn't started treatment with uh, BR mm. um, and their IgM levels are somewhere in the 5,000 and more mm. level. Mm. And Quite often I've heard that, you know, when you get over 4,000, you know, you need to be concerned. Mm. But absent any symptoms of hyperviscosity, what kind of levels are you comfortable yeah, with? Yeah. And, then, and then just a corollary to that. Mm -hmm. um, at what point um, would you want to, you know, if you're doing BR, would you want to delay um, the rituxan on the first yeah. the first treatment just to uh, avoid any issues of flare? Yeah. So there's no one answer that fits, suits all. Firstly, I think about the age of the patient, the tempo of the disease, and I have a very good look at their arms. Because I actually quite like to give bendamustine and rituximab together. Um, and I will often, therefore, give them when their IgM, if it looks like it's going to happen, and your IgM is going to hit 40 or 50, and you're going to need treatment, and it suits you and your lifestyle to have treatment now rather than in a few months' time. You know, I don't, I'm not a zealot in terms of waiting to IgM of 60. Particularly now, I know I have lots of options up my sleeve for that patient playing the long game. But sometimes what I will do is if they've got really good veins, I will actually do a plasma exchange and reduce their um, uh, IG, you know, if certainly if they've got symptomatic hyperviscosity, I will plasma exchange them and take the IgM off and then get started. Um, the other thing you can do is you can do a weekly follow-up, and if it looks like they're going to have a flare, because not everyone has a flare, if it looks like they're going to flare, then we just plasma exchange them then. But the, if you've got a patient with terrible veins, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be getting yourself into trouble with that. And so that's where I might start the bendamustine and the rituximab later. Thank you, I'm very happy to take any further questions later. <laughs>